this case, the plume for a, uh, of a non-reactive solute is going to be strongly affected by the heterogeneity in the hydraulic conductivity. On the other hand, for a reactive solute which adsorbs onto the porous materials, it is going to be not only affected by the heterogeneity in the hydraulic conductivity, but also the heterogeneity in the uh, sorption coefficients. Now, I'd, I just wanted to illustrate to you uh, what spatial variab variability of hydraulic conductivity might look like in a field set setting. And this here is a cross-section showing the distribution of the logarithm of hydraulic conductivity at the Borden Aquifer where much of our, or many of our field experiments are conducted. In fact, these measurements were taken right at the site of a very large-scale natural gradient tracer experiment that was conducted by Waterloo researchers in conjunction with Stanford University researchers. And we went to the field and took a core every meter along this transect and another transect and measured the hydraulic conductivity every five centimeters along the core. And if you contour or color the diagrams, you obtain a spatial distribution like this. And you can see that as a more or less a layered type deposit, here's some very low hydraulic conductivity layers. The reddish zones indicate higher hydraulic conductivity zones, with variations typically being on the order of a factor of 5 to 10. And one can do a geostatistical analysis of, to describe the spatial variations in hydraulic conductivity, such as the geometric mean, the variance of the log of hydraulic conductivity. And we use logs because hydraulic conductivity is generally found to be log normally distributed. And you can also estimate things called the correlation lengths, which describe the average distance over which permeability is correlated. Or another way of thinking of it is the average length or thickness of a hydraulic conductivity bed. And because of the heterogeneities, then groundwater flowing through this uh, aquifer here is going to be variable, and the variable groundwater velocity is going to enhance dispersion. And we call that enhanced dispersion macro dispersion. And there are a, a number of theories which exist that can predict the values of the macro dispersion coefficients given the statistical properties of the hydraulic conductivity variations. Now, uh, Several years after we made these measurements, we, we took the very same cores, which were kept in storage, and measured the KD for the chemical uh, radionuclide strontium uh, at every point that we measured the hydraulic conductivity. And you can get an idea of the variability of the strontium KD, which is not nearly as much as the hydraulic conductivity and doesn't demonstrate the same pattern in general, but there are certain similarities or correlations between hydraulic conductivity and KD. For example, here's a, a zone with uh, high KD, these uh, yellowish zones, which tend to correspond to the zones of lowest hydraulic conductivity. So the question becomes, how does the variability in KD combined with the variability in hydraulic conductivity affect plume evolution? And what we'd like to do is define perhaps some effective KD value that at the field scale could be put in a model to describe bulk retardation of the solute. <clears throat> now, this, this is a diagram which shows, at least for the Borden study using the solute strontium, the relationship or lack of relationship between log of KD and log of hydraulic conductivity. And there are about 3,000 data points here. Now, if you do a statistical analysis, uh, the, st the regression would show that there is an overall negative correlation between those two parameters, but it is very weak. In fact, the R coefficient from regression is only about 0.13. But because there is so much data, it's statist statistically significant. I've seen other data from the Cape Cod site, uh, data collected by Kathy Hess and Warren Wood of the U.S. Geological Survey uh, for the solute strontium. And in that case, or sorry, the, the solute lithium, and in that case, there's a much more definite relationship, which is negative, between KD and hydraulic conductivity. And here's a, uh, actually a snap, some snapshots of the tracer plume that was uh, injected at the Cape Cod site. And this happens to be for bromide, and it's a plan view snapshot at three different times. And we can see the, here's the injection point, and flow is in this direction. We can see that the plume is extended considerably in the direction of flow, which is longitudinal dispersion. And that dispersion is much larger than the dispersion you would see in a field column. 
And here's for a reactive solute, lithium, which adsorbs onto the porous material. And because of that negative cross-correlation between hydraulic conductivity and KD, there is an enhanced dispersion in the longitudinal direction of that reactive solute. And that's because uh, the retardation due to sorption in high permeability beds is very low. The retardation in low permeability beds is very high. If there's this inverse correlation, that increases the solute variability, which enhances dispersion. We see some other effects which can show up if uh, uh, one performs tracer tests involving reactive solutes in aquifers. And this is a, a slide taken from a paper by uh, Paul Roberts and others, uh, w which was published ab about 10 years ago. And it's based on the Borden natural gradient, gradient tracer test. Here's, I'm showing the distance traveled by the plume, the center of mass versus time. This is for chloride, and it's more or less a straight line. If you take the slope of that line, that gives you the bulk groundwater velocity uh, of the plume. And this is the uh, plume uh, distance versus time graphs, or the, the distance versus uh, time plots for the various chemicals which tend to adsorb onto the porous materials, and they show a curvature, which indicates a deceleration of the plume with time. And if I take the slope of these curves, at various times for the reactive solutes and compare it to the slope of this curve, I can define a field scale retardation factor. And if we plot that with time, what we see is this bulk retardation factor which changes with time. And there have been various hypotheses put forward in the literature as to why that might have happened. One of them is that the sorption is not occurring in an equilibrium reversible fashion, but perhaps in a kinetic fashion. Another one is that the isotherms describing the sorption process is, in fact, not linear and maybe nonlinear. Um, others have said that perhaps there's intraparticle diffusion, which affects the uptake of the chemical uh, because it must diffuse into the interior of a grain and then sorb. And we began to speculate perhaps this behavior is due to heterogeneity in the uh, KD field as well as a hydraulic conductivity field. So I just want to explore numerically the issue of the nature and degree of the cross-correlation between hydraulic conductivity and sorption parameters on plume evolution. And we'll use a numerical approach where we generate in three dimensions high-resolution hydraulic conductivity and KD fields. We'll then solve the steady state flow equation, solve the advection dispersion equation for solute transport. And because we represent all the details in the groundwater flow paths, in other words, the heterogeneities explicitly, we use very small local scale dispersion parameters. And we assume only local equilibrium sorption within each individual bed. And we compute, we do this over and over again in a Monte Carlo framework and compute ensemble statistics. Uh, concerning the plume behavior. We investigated both negative cross-correlations between KD and K and positive cross-correlations with either perfect, uh, this refers to perfect uh, cross-correlation, in other words, your data points would fall exactly on a straight line, versus a case where this C squared or coherency is less than one and we have scatter in the relationship. And what does that scatter do to plume behavior? Here is a, a single realization which we generated. Uh, the upper diagram is a hydraulic conductivity field. This is about 80 meters in length, 30 meters in width, and about 5 meters in thickness. We introduce a solute at one end and let it migrate through this domain and watch the dispersion occur. And you can see the lenticular uh, bodies of, of sand that are uh, distributed throughout this heterogeneous uh, material. And here's the co-generated distribution coefficient field, assuming negative cross-correlation between those two parameters and perfect coherency. So zones of red here exactly agree with zones of blue and vice versa. On the other hand, if we uh, decrease the coherency so the relationship between K and KD becomes fuzzy, then zones of blue here no longer exactly agree with zones of red in the hydraulic conductivity. And these are the shapes of the plumes that we obtain. And this happens to be uh, the isoconcentration surface for a value of C over C0.004. 
Here's the non-reactive plume, such as chloride, and we can see that it has become extended in the direction of flow, which is macro, longitudinal macro dispersion. But you can see the effects of, of perhaps a low permeability lens, which is causing these fingers or protrusions to develop in the plume. The middle diagram is for the case where we have a negative cross-correlation between hydraulic conductivity and KD and perfect cross-correlation, C squared equal to 1. And that negative relationship or inverse relationship is considerably extended the length of the plume, just as we uh, have noted for the Cape Cod site. When we produce a fuzzy inverse relationship between hydraulic conductivity and KD, the plume becomes even longer after an equivalent travel distance. So clearly, this relationship uh, poses some problems from a modeling perspective if this behavior occurs because it means that we have to define unique dispersion parameters for every solute that happens to absorb differently onto the porous materials. Now, this is a, a, these two diagrams here, the upper one for the non-reactive and the middle one for the reactive, are the same as the two previous ones we've already examined. The lower one is the one I want to focus on, and that is for the case where we have a positive cross-correlation between hydraulic conductivity and KD. And we see that in that case, there's almost no macro dispersion of the plume. In fact, the opposite is happening to the case of negative cross-correlation because high hydraulic conductivity beds have high retardation, low hydraulic conductivity beds have low retardation, and that tends to cancel or reduce the velocity variability of the solute within the aquifer, and hence low dispersion. I mentioned the retardation effect, uh, very, that it could vary with time, and I'm showing here the bulk retardation factor computed as the velocity of the non-reactive solute or the bulk velocity of the reactive one versus time. And if we solve this problem many, many times, uh, given those statistics of those two fields, this would be the ensemble mean. And what it shows is that the retardation factor with this inverse relationship between K and KD gradually increases and approaches the arithmetic average of the locally variable retardation factors. And that's what stochastic analytic theory predicts. However, if we look at individual realizations, for example, this one, that one increases very dramatically at uh, early time. In fact, very similar to the chemical PCE in the Borden tracer test. On the other hand, here's another one where the retardation factor actually decreased with time. And that leads one to believe, what is the utility of ensemble mean uh, 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 theories uh, if one recognizes that the field is actually only a single realization of the ensemble of aquifers one can generate, given only the statistics. These are some of the macro retardation factors, and I don't want to dwell on this very much, but these are longitudinal macro dispersivities for the conservative solute from our numerical simulations. We get one meter for those trials we try, uh, I showed you from theory developed by Gelhar and Axness. It's actually quite close, 0.71 meters, and some theory developed by Dagan. It's on the order of one meter. So the stochastic analytic theory represented by these two numbers here are actually giving values which are reasonably close, given that there are many assumptions in these theories. With regard to the reactive solute, here's our numerical derived results. And I just want to show you for the cases where we have negative cross-correlation, which are these three, this one, this one, and this one, as the fuzziness in that relationship between K and KD uh, increases, the macro dispersivity tends to increase, which again means that for every different chemical that might sorb differently, you may have to define unique dispersion parameters. If one uses those macro dispersion coefficients and replaces the heterogeneous aquifer with a dispersively and hydraulically equivalent homogeneous one, you would make a prediction something like this. And this is an average over 50 realizations. Solve the problem 50 times an average. You get the classical elliptical plume. However, comparing this plume to the previous ones I've shown, obviously there's going to be uh, some uncertainty in the prediction. And I'm showing here the standard deviation of the concentration. And it looks something like this. And it tends to have a minimum near the center and a minimum, minimum around the fringes. And in the lower diagram, I'm showing you the probability that the concentration exceeds some value, such as drinking water standard. And you'll note that this probability plume looks very similar to the actual concentration plume. 
And <clears throat> uh, I'm comparing here the standard deviation of the concentration along the plume center line to some first order theories that have been uh, published in the li literature. And these are analytic formula for pr predicting the uncertainty. Here's uh, an, uh, results from theory based on Degan's work. This is some theory, analytic theory based on von Boris and Gelhardt. And we can see our numerical uh, results are falling within the envelope of those two predictions. And that's very gratifying because literally with the back of the envelope, uh, one can make calculations knowing the statistics of the variability uh, using these theories, what the magnitude of the prediction uncertainty is. So the main conclusion I, I want to draw here is that negative cross-correlation between hydraulic conductivity uh, and sorption parameters enhances longitudinal dispersion. However, it has little effect on uh, transverse macro dispersion. And the opposite is also true, where we have a positive cross-correlation between this parameter and this parameter, we get very little field scale dispersion. Now, the final topic I'll touch on is remediation of non-aqueous phase liquids, or NAPLs, uh, in heterogeneous sandy aquifers. And this is very recent work which is being performed in conjunction with Dr. Peter Forsyth at, in computer science at the University of Waterloo and a PhD student, Andre Unger, that we're co-supervising. And <clears throat> I've listed here some of the remediation technologies that are commonly applied to clean up NAPL contamination sites. They all essentially rely on large mass transfer rates of the contaminant between phases. Um, some of them are air sparging, vacuum extraction, steam injection, chemical flooding such as alcohol floods or surfactant flushes. And these here, steam injection and chemical flooding, are essentially enhanced oil recovery technologies. And the difference in environmental application is that we must remove essentially all of the NAPL in the pore space. Otherwise, it's going to remain a persistent source of groundwater contamination. And it's very common in practice that people use two or more of these technologies in conjunction in order to get an improved removal rate of the NAPL. And what I'll focus on here is denapl removal, which is dense non-aqueous phase liquid, uh, by air sparging and vacuum extraction used in conjunction. And what we'll do is we'll spill the chemical trichloroethylene in our numerical model into a heterogeneous and actually a very heterogeneous sand and gravel aquifer. Um, the air sparging involves simply injecting air below the water table. Uh, vacuum extraction is withdrawal of the contaminated vapor from above the water table. And the mechanisms that are uh, believed to occur, or one hopes will occur, is mass transfer of the contaminant from the non-aqueous phase to the gas phase. That's what the air sparging is supposed to do. And uh, the vacuum extraction involves mass transfer of the contaminant from the aqueous phase to the gas phase. In terms of the model, I'll just very briefly describe it. It is a 3D, three-phase compositional simulator. The three phases, which are mobile, are the aqueous phase or the groundwater, the non-aqueous phase, and the gas. The components we consider are water, air, and multiple contaminants. So our non-aqueous phase liquid could, in fact, be comprised of a mixture of organic chemicals. Um, the mass transfer between phases that is allowed is, is such that in the aqueous phase, we only consider water and contaminants. In the non-aqueous phase, only contaminants are considered in a model. And in the gas phase, we have water, air, and contaminants. So we have advection and dispersion between, within each phase of these chemicals or components. And we have mass transfer between phases, including sorption of the contaminants onto the solid surface. Now, here's the physical setting that we're going to simulate. It's a box which is 10 meters by 10 meters by 5 meters in total thickness, which is a similar scale to the experiment that was performed at Borden involving the spillage of uh, Dean Apple. It is surrounded by cutoff walls, which are impermeable. The base is impermeable. The upper surface is also impermeable. These are the air sparging wells, which we have chosen to be horizontal in the hopes of getting better contact of the rising air phase with the Dean Apple. And this is the location of the vacuum extraction well. Uh, the water table is initially at a depth of 1.5 meters below the surface, and we'll spill the Dean apple, in fact, 800 liters of it, right at this point here. 
And the first case we'll look at is partially penetrating cutoff walls. In other words, these are hanging walls where water is allowed to flow in from outside and try to maintain a water table inside the box. This is a permeability realization that was generated. It's also layered and is very heterogeneous with commonly two to three orders of magnitude contrast and permeability between beds. And this shows the Dean Apple distribution following the spill. After everything has come to rest, the Dean Apple is shown as the red uh, surface. In fact, that's the 1% isosaturation surface. Here's the vacuum extraction wells, which are not yet turned on. And the blue bubbles represent the air phase saturations. So the water table roughly is through here. And you can see some hint of a capillary fringe. This is after one hour, and what you note first is that the water table suddenly rose because we applied a vacuum uh, by turning on the vacuum extractor. You can see the air beginning to rise from these vacuum extraction wells, but most of the air is rising from only one end of these air sparging wells. Uh, and that's because of the presence of a low permeability layer here and the fact that as the air rises here, uh, water is moving around, groundwater is moving and increasing the uh, aqueous phase pressure, which tends to impede air uh, entry into the aquifer along those portions. After one day, we've begun to strip away some of the chemicals by vapor extraction from the unsaturated zone. We've begun to uh, uh, strip away some of the Dean Apple from the water table, below the water table in this region here. We can see that the air is, is channeling as it rises and it's forming some pools below the low permeability layers. And these low permeability layers are the ones shown in a greenish color. If we proceed in time, we now, after 10 days, have removed most of the Dean Apple from uh, the unsaturated zone, but, and, and some from this region below the water table. But one thing that I'd like to point out is there's very little air contact, direct air can contact between uh, or with the non-aqueous phase liquid. So the volatilization of the Dean Apple below the water table by air sparging is, is really not what's controlling here. And what we sorted out or believe that is occurring is as the air rises here, it's desaturating the, the uh, soil. So groundwater wants to move towards this zone of desaturation by capillarity. As it moves through this zone, it's dissolving the Dean Apple. And the contaminated uh, groundwater then is vaporized in this region the contaminated vapors rise and then it's uh, extracted. So it's really a dissolution control problem ultimately. And I'll just step through time. After 30 days, we're dissolving more and more of the Dean Apple. You can see some is remaining on the pools. After 55 days, we have about uh, 20 or so liters of Dean Apple remaining on this low permeability layer. And groundwater is again just sweeping by and dissolving it. And uh, the, the reason why the groundwater continues to sweep by and dissolve it is it's flowing in below the base of those partially penetrating cutoff walls. And finally, after one year, the Dean Apple is completely gone. But I want to point out that the Groundwater itself is still heavily contaminated with TCE, as well as the gas phase. If we, I'll just show you very briefly what happens if we have fully penetrating cutoff walls. No groundwater is allowed to flow into this box whatsoever. And this shows you the Dean Apple that remains after one year. In fact, there's about 150 liters that remain. The Dean Apple is sitting on a low permeability lens, and it's surrounded by a, in fact, a stagnant groundwater zone. And the only way that the Dean Apple can now disappear is by diffusion of the Dean Apple once it enters the aqueous phase, diffusion across the stagnant groundwater zone, and then vaporization. We can see how we've dried out a considerable zone of this box. And diffusion is a slow process, and that's why without any water circulating within this box, we're getting very long remediation times. And to demonstrate, perhaps, what we could ask the question, what is the sensitivity of remediation to hydraulic conductivity variability or permeability variations? So here's two aquifers which have exactly the same statistical properties, but obviously the point-to-point -point permeability values are very different between these two. This shows the NAPL distribution. This is the one we already saw. 
uh, for the realization one. This is realization two. And the thing to note is during the spillage phase, the point-to-point -point variability in permeability has a dramatic influence on the distribution of the Dean apple. However, if we look at remediation times, here's volume of TCE versus time, and this is for scenario one where we have partially penetrating cutoff walls and water is allowed to circulate. Okay, to enter below the walls, uh, passes through the Dean apple, dissolves it, then the contaminated groundwater gets vaporized and extracted. Um, it demonstrates very little sensitivity to the uh, different permeability realizations. And that's because this circulating groundwater that occurs is acting like a natural averaging process, which smooths out any effects due to point-to-point -point variations in permeability. On the other hand, when we have a completely sealed box, fully penetrating cutoff walls, there is much more sensitivity to the individual permeability realizations, which is not a good thing from an a actual a field cleanup perspective because one does not want to have to go in the field and have to measure permeability values everywhere within the zone of concern because that's extremely expensive. But this technique where we allow water to circulate, one does not have to be so concerned with measuring parameters such as permeability from point to point. So just to conclude then, um, our, our primary conclusion is that air sparging coupled with vacuum extraction is essentially a dissolution controlled below the water table. And it is not controlled by uh, the air directly contacting the Dean apple and vaporizing it and then the, the contaminated vapors uh, rising and being extracted by the uh, vacuum extraction well. Uh, initially, however, that does occur in the unsaturated zone where you have intimate contact with the, with the air phase and the Dean apple. And I think that's pretty much it, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge the Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers and the National Groundwater Association for sponsoring uh, the Darcy Lecture Series. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at the Waterloo Center for Groundwater Research and the Department of Earth Sciences and the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research of Council, Council of Canada who sponsor my research. And special thanks to all my, my students and research associates who, who largely did all of the work. And uh, to Jackie Mack and my secretary, Margaret Lewis, for their, uh, I think, tremendous organizational skills. Thank you. <laughs>